the next thing that we're going to do now is we're going to have one last one last kind of just real kind of core things that almost all cells do. And we're going to talk about cellular respiration in a little more detail. Um, there's all sorts of important metabolic pathways going on in cells that are, you know, eventually you'll learn more about, but this is the one we usually bring in just to give you a, a semi deep dive to get a sense of what are these pathways really looking like? This one is again, in almost every one of your cells, like red blood cells don't do it. Um, there's a few cells that don't, but almost all your cells use cellular respiration to make their ATP to get the energy to do what they need to do. At the core of cellular respiration, what is the, what is the formula that describes it? This, uh, what's the chemical formula that describes cellular respiration? The ATP equals ADP or a, yeah, that one. Um, no, that's more using ATP once you've already got it to deliver energy to some process. That's not, cellular respiration is how the cell's making the ATP in the first place. C6H12O6. Six plus yeah. O2. Yeah, so we have this uh, and this, what's, what's the other name for this little dude? Glucose. It's just glucose plus six oxygens. And it becomes? Carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide, water. Energy. Yeah, and energy. And typically we'll say like 34 to 36 ATP ultimately is how we capture that energy, right? Because this is just the combustion of glucose. I've mentioned this before. If you lit sugar on fire and you just warmed your hands by the heat and saw the soft glow of the light of the flames, that would be the energy in terms of light and heat, It'd be the same basic equation. Um, but we are going to have to get really kind of complicated if we want to get that energy and capture it in ATP rather than just have it be the light and heat of a fire. Here we go. I'm going to show you this because I think it will get you in the mood for what's going to happen next. Um, so this is a classic Rube Goldberg device, which if you've never seen these, they're, they're funny. The basic idea here is, I'm giving you this because this reminds me of cellular respiration. Something that seems pretty simple, like we drew that equation, which looks really straightforward. Sugar plus oxygen gives you water, carbon dioxide, and ATP. What could be simpler? Um, everything. You know, this is a device designed to wipe his mouth with a napkin after he takes a spoonful of soup. And he takes the spoon full of soup up to his mouth. As he does that, it pulls on the string. As it pulls on the string, it pulls on the spoon, which flips the cracker up into the air. Once the cracker is up in the air, the parrot flies over to get the cracker. And when the parrot flies off of this lever, it then lets the sand fall down into this little bucket. As the bucket fills with sand, it pulls on the string. The string then pulls and opens up this lighter. And then when the lighter turns on, it lights the fuse of this little rocket. And as a rocket flies up, it's attached to this little sickle knife, which cuts the string. And when the string gets cut, it frees the pendulum from this clock, which is attached to the napkin, which is gonna wipe his mouth. So, and you're probably wondering why am I showing you this? Um, because cellular respiration, at least in my mind, reminds me a lot of this. Um, we're gonna start with sugar. 
And by the end, we'll use six oxygens and we'll end up with six carbon dioxides and six waters and 36 ATP. But it's not going to be straightforward. During that process, we're going to have the energy stored, you know, in the bonds starting in the glucose, then stored in high energy electron carriers, the NADHs, as well as in pyruvates, and then in acetyl CoAs, and then go into the mitochondria and run through Krebs cycle and get more energy stored in more NADHs, and then use that with the cytochromes, these electron transport systems in the inner mitochondrial membrane to pump hydrogens and make hydrogen gradients. And now the energy is stored in hydrogen gradients. And finally, those hydrogens are gonna come down through this membrane protein called an ATPase and ultimately make the ATP at the end. Um, but like I said, it's gonna be lots of different steps. So when you're trying to understand um, cellular respiration, we're gonna go back to the original equation and do kind of the tally to make sure that we start with the sugar and with the ATP, use up the oxygen, make the water and the carbon dioxide. But where that happens is not gonna be intuitive if you haven't, um, haven't looked at this before. Um, you know, we'll go into it in more depth than you would have looked at it in Bio 110, you know, less depth than you'd look at it in perhaps a major's biology class, but it's, it's worth looking at. And some of the intermediates along the way are actually worth getting to know as well because they play roles in other things that we're gonna see. We are gonna just knock out cellular respiration right now. Um, so we kind of stay on top of things. Um, and then we'll take our little break and we'll get into the lab stuff. Um, but so we are kind of gonna continue with kind of content right now. And cellular respiration. And like I said, the overall equation that is ultimately going to describe this process is just glucose plus six oxygen ending up with six water and six carbon dioxide plus, and we're gonna see why the number of ATP is not quite so defined. It's more of an energetic calculation and there's a few different options in here, but it's not as um, locked into just one equation to the next as you might think. Cause like I said, the energy is going to be stored in all these intermediate um, places along the way. Um, so cellular respiration. Um, there's two main um, places that this breakdown of sugar to ultimately get ATP is happening. So first, in the cytosol of the cell, So this is not happening in the mitochondria at all. This is the first part's just happening. All the enzymes we need are sitting, just floating around in the cytosol, the fluid inside the cell. We're gonna have what's called glycolysis. You know, glycolysis um, doesn't need oxygen at all. So we say it's like anaerobic. Um, it does make some ATP, but it doesn't make much. You know, only get to net ATP. So it's a way of breaking down sugar. You don't even need any oxygen. You get some ATP. This will be useful. We'll see this in muscle metabolism in our fast twitch muscle fibers because it happens really fast. Um, this is how red blood cells get their energy. Um, but in general, it doesn't release most of the energy, right? There's enough energy in a sugar molecule to ultimately make 36 ATP. So if we want to be able to get the rest of that energy, 
then we have to go into the mitochondria. So the second, these are gonna, it's gonna be in the mitochondria. Then we're gonna have this whole other thing, sometimes they call oxidative phosphorylation. I may spell that better. Meaning it's using, so this uses oxygen. It needs oxygen to run. It's happening in the mitochondria and you know, you know, get an ultimately a net 34 to 36 ATP. So we're gonna look at both of these processes. We'll start with this first part. The first part of this process is gonna happen in the cytosol. It's called glycolysis and it doesn't need O2. So let's look at that first. And again, glyco, sugar, lysis break apart. Obviously it's gonna start with sugar. Yeah, C6H12O6. It's gonna be a metabolic pathway. It's gonna have 10 different steps. The first step is sugar becomes phosphorylated glucose. This is an intermediate. Um, what are we gonna have to have in order to run this metabolic pathway from one step to the next step? An enzyme. Exactly, an enzyme. So there's gonna be an enzyme involved here. We're gonna have a hexokinase. Again, hexo meaning for a six carbon sugar kinase, it phosphorylates something. This is the enzyme that phosphorylates glucose as the first step in our, um, in our process. Um, and then that's gonna get turned into a phosphorylated fructose actually. It's gonna be like the next step. with some other enzyme running that. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool about the first step is that phosphorylated glucose can't go through the carrier. So it locks the sugar in the cell for the rest of this process, right? The glucose comes in and out through the glucose carrier just based on concentration gradients and such, but the phosphorylated glucose is locked inside. Um, there's going to be 10 steps. Dot, dot, dot. Um, the end products of this whole thing after 10 steps, we're going to end up with two net ATP. Maybe I should do it in a different color. I'm saying net ATP because it actually takes some ATP to run this thing. You know, it takes AT, it takes two ATP actually to make this whole process go. So even though you're making four ATP along the way, you end up with two that you didn't have to start with. So at the end of this, there's two net ATP. Um, and then the other place you have, you, the other molecules you end up with, you end up with two NADHs. And these are these high energy electron carriers. And again, if you remember, I've mentioned, I'll, I'll mention again, NAD plus, this is the kind of oxidized version, but what happens is it gets reduced. This plus a hydrogen plus two electrons becomes NADH. And when you see NADH, you think about electrons that are stored in a very high energy configuration. So again, imagine it's like taking, um, it's like taking 
I don't know, water and putting it up into the reservoir at the very top of the hill. So you can let it roll down the hill to then do some work. When we let NADH contribute electrons to other things, as those electrons get transferred to another molecule in these redox reactions, energy gets released and we can use that energy to do stuff. Kind of, again, the same, you know, the metaphor would be like, we have water stored up in this reservoir and then we can let it flow down the hill and then we can put a paddle wheel you know, in, the, in the stream of water as it flows down. And as the paddle wheel spins, we can use it to grind flour or run generators or whatever. So the same thing, when you have electrons that are part of NADH, they can get donated from this high energy configuration to another place where they're in a lower energy configuration. And as they like fall energetically, so to speak, you can capture that energy to do stuff, which we will be seeing. So whenever you see NADH, think about molecule that has got a lot of potential energy stored in its electrons that you can, you can usually use in special reactions. And then we end up, in addition to the two NADHs, we have two pyruvates. These are three carbon molecules. Um, right, glucose has six carbons. We now have these two three carbon pyruvates. Um, there's still a lot of energy stored in the bonds of the pyruvate that we have not captured yet. So we have the two ATP, but if we ultimately want the 36 ATP, we're gonna have to milk this NADH and these pyruvates to get the energy that's still stored in there. But if there is not oxygen around, you still got some ATP. So you still got, you're at a net win, but then you have these things left over. Um, if there's oxygen around, both of these are going to go into the mitochondria for the next steps. So if we have oxygen, we can take these things that still have a lot of energy stored within them and continue our processing and continue to extract the energy that was originally in that glucose. Um, if there is no oxygen, we can just call it good. Say we got a couple of ATP and what happens is actually the NADHs um, give their electrons to the pyruvates which accept them and they make actually lactic acid. So we'll get two net ATP. These guys just basically um, um, kind of cancel each other out. The lactic acid ultimately is gonna go to the liver and get, um, get regenerated back into other stuff and cleared out. Um, this, sometimes they call this anaerobic respiration. Um, it's also, what's another word for that? Isn't lactic acid what's responsible for causing like cramps when you're working out or like when your muscles get tired? You know, it's- I can't it's, remember what it's called. So lactic, lactic acid is, does have to get cleared out. We, we'll talk more about that later when we do muscle metabolism. Um, this is called fermentation is the official word for this. Difference between anaerobic respiration and fermentation? It's the same thing. Okay. So other, other, others, like if, if you look at yeast, for instance, yeast is doing the same thing, but instead of making lactic acid, they make ethanol.
right? That's really nice for us because that's how we get wine and beer. You have like little yeast growing in either like, you know, grape juice or malted barley that's been like, you know, if you have sugar and yeast, they do this process of anaerobic respiration, make ethanol, that's how you get alcohol in your wine and beer. Um, in our cells, they do this anaerobic respiration, make lactic acid, which then ultimately is gonna go to the liver to get converted into other stuff. Um, but so this is a place you can stop. If you um, don't have oxygen, or as we'll see in muscle metabolism, if you just need to make ATP really fast in this direct way, um, this is actually, this does occur in the, in the body. Um, I can share briefly. This is just a picture from your book um, showing kind of the you know, more formal steps of this process, starting with glucose here. Here's our phosphorylated glucose, a phosphorylated fructose, you know, ultimately ending up with our pyruvate and ATP down here. Um, this is just the metabolic pathway occurring in the cytosol that is known as glycolysis. Um, it's actually worth paying attention to this little thing right here, this 1,3-BPG, which is just one of the intermediates of glycolysis. This is actually going to come up later when we're doing the respiratory system. Um, when you have lots of 1,3-BPG in the cells, that's a sign that the cell's doing a lot of metabolic activity. It's actually going to affect how tightly hemoglobin binds onto oxygen. It's actually going to affect hemoglobin binding affinity for oxygen. We've talked about binding affinity. So when there's lots of 1,3-BPG, that's one of the things that actually affects hemoglobin's hold on oxygen. It'll make it let go of more oxygen because it's assuming there's more metabolic activity and we need more oxygen going on and it's released into the cells. But don't worry, that's, that's for later. But just kind of as a, as a slight teaser, this 1,3-BPG will come in later as a, you know, as a kind of flag to the cell that there's a lot of metabolic activity going on, a lot of glycolysis happening in the cell. Um, So, any questions about the basics of glycolysis? It's happening in the cytosol. Starts with glucose, does not need any oxygen, you'll notice. Only makes two ATP. And the rest of the energy is still stored in our pyruvates and in our NADHs. All good? Um, you said that that's the main, the main way that <clears throat> red blood cells get their energy, right? Yeah, because they don't, they don't actually do cellular respiration, I th partly because they have very little metabolic needs. There's not much going on in a red blood cell. They don't even have a nucleus. And also, they are, their job is carrying oxygen. So it'd be kind of a, you know, you don't want them sucking, you know, sucking up oxygen if their job is to pick it up and take it someplace else. So, okay. So what we're going to do now is take the NADH and the pyruvates into the mitochondria and just finish this process and see how those are broken down to get the rest of the ATP. Oops. So now we're going into the mitochondria. Um, they are these really fascinating little organelles. Um, do, do people know about the endosymbiont hypothesis of mitochondria? Yeah. So what, what is the endosymbiont hypothesis? I think, <clears throat> I think it's that once upon a time, there was a 
prokaryote exactly. that ate um or it basically if there's some prokaryote maybe some little bacteria kind of thing that got eaten by another cell mm -hmm. but instead of just eating it and digesting it it took it inside and realized that this little thing in here is doing stuff useful. And this thing became formalized as a little double membrane organelle. I mean, part of the reason there's evidence for this endosymbiont hypothesis is that the mitochondria actually has two membranes. It has an outer membrane and an inner membrane, which tends to have more kind of folds to increase surface area. So there's two membranes. So this is like a mitochondria. I thought it also had to do with the fact that mitochondria has its own DNA. So it, it, that as well. So the you remember the codons that that um, describe what are the three nucleotide bases that define one amino acid versus another. The code for your main genome has different codons than the mitochondrial DNA has. So the, that's more evidence that this mitochondria started out as a different creature that then got internalized. And at this point, mitochondria can't live on their own. Um, and the, 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 what do you call it? The um, divisions or multiplications of mitochondria is kind of a mix of both the mitochondria doing their stuff and the cell doing stuff together to make new mitochondria. They're very dynamic little things. I saw there's, they've, they've increased the ability to image in living cells. And these things are like these cool little weird animated worms moving around and doing stuff. Um, but so mitochondria inside the cell, two membranes, that's gonna be important actually, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Um, the inside of this of this thing is called the matrix. So we're going to do. Let's take a look at this now and look at it in more detail. This is basically my outer mitochondrial membrane. Um, here's going to be my inner mitochondrial membrane. Right, this is just inside the cell here. Maybe I should call it the cytosol. Um, this down here, this is my matrix, the mitochondrial matrix, just the inside of this thing. Maybe I'll give it a nice color. There's the matrix. And then the other piece that we should still pay attention to is that there is this intermembrane space in between there. That's gonna be important as well. So this is the basic layout. So we have the pyruvates come in here. Which is our little three carbon things that were um, produced during glycolysis. And they are going to get transformed into acetyl-CoA's. Let me spell that better. This is a little two carbon thing. Crack. Back again. There we go. So acetyl-CoA is a little too, so it's another intermediate. 
we went from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Um, while we're doing this, I might as well go back to our original C6H12O6 plus six oxygen going to six CO2 plus six H2O plus 36 ATP. If we wanna keep track of this whole process, by the end of it, we need to end up with all of this equation accounted for. So we have the sugar accounted for. The sugar started the whole process. When we do this step, take the pyruvates, these three carbon uh, molecules, and turn them into the acetyl-CoA's, which are these two carbon molecules, obviously a carbon gets um, released. The carbon that's released and goes off is going to be a CO2. Now, how many CO2s ultimately get produced for each glucose at this step? Six, right? No, how many pyruvates do we make from one glucose? Two. You make two. So if each pyruvate releases one carbon dioxide, that means we're gonna have two of the six CO2s produced at this step. Does that, does that make sense? By the time we're done, we're gonna have all six CO2s and the oxygens and the waters and everything accounted for. But at this step, I'm kind of showing you how this more convoluted process ultimately is going to be described by this equation, by this chemical formula. So the first step that's released, the, when it releases the CO2, the two pyruvates equals two CO2s? Yeah, because each pyruvate gets turned, each three carbon molecule gets turned into a two carbon molecule in acetyl-CoA and a CO2, which is then a waste product. So that's right, because a pyruvate has three carbons you have to account for. Two of those carbons stay <clears> in the acetyl-CoA <throat> and the third carbon becomes a carbon dioxide. Right? Is that because the carbon is pairing with the initial input of oxygen? No, no, there's no oxygen involved yet. Oh, okay. This is just a, it's just an enzymatically catalyzed reaction that takes a pyruvate and, you know, turns it into acetyl acetyl CoA as well as a carbon dioxide. So does that does that does that make sense? All right. Acetyl CoA then gets fed into what's called the Krebs cycle, which most people have probably heard of before. The Krebs cycle, it's called a cycle because it's, an, it's eight intermediates that just keep going round and round. So acetyl-CoA goes in with this thing called an oxaloacetate. You don't have to know oxaloacetate, but it's just a, an inter, another intermediate floating around here. And together they become citric acid. Which is a six carbon. Oxaloacetate is four carbon. You'll see why we care in a second. Um, citric acid then gets catalyzed to something else, which gets catalyzed to something else, which I'm mean, gonna wanna make sure one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So each of these is gonna be another step. Citric acid becomes another intermediate, becomes another intermediate, becomes another intermediate, becomes another intermediate, becomes another intermediate. That becomes an oxaloacetate. That oxaloacetate will then pair with the next acetyl-CoA that's getting fed into the cycle. 
And that becomes a new citric acid, which goes through all these steps, becomes an oxaloacetate, which then pairs with the next acetyl-CoA that's getting fed into this. So this is called the Krebs cycle. It's also called the citric acid cycle because it makes citric acid as the first. Citric acid is three carboxyls, so it's also called the TCA tricarboxylic acid cycle. But it's basically a metabolic pathway that just kind of, it's like a snake eating its tail. The last step here, this oxaloacetate will bind with the next acetyl-CoA. Um, question? You just, answered, you just answered it, thank you. So in this process, let's talk about why it's useful. So first, actually, let's just follow the carbons while we're here. If we go from a six carbon citric acid at the beginning to a four carbon oxaloacetate at the end, that means we've lost another two, carbon di another two carbons for each spin here, right? So that's gonna be two more carbon dioxide released for each acetyl-CoA that, that ultimately enters the, the, the Krebs cycle. Does that make sense? If we spin from the beginning here to the end, we've lost two carbons. Those two carbons go off as two CO2s. Right, because we have to all, however, we have to have six carbons by the end. There's six carbons to start. At the end, we have four carbons in the oxaloacetate and two carbons that left as CO2s. Now we're at a total of four carbons, right? Um, that have been lost? Although, except because we have two pyruvates, right? We're gonna have two spins of the cycle for every initial, initial sugar. So we're gonna have actually four more. This is gonna account for all the rest of the carbon dioxides here. We have two, like for each, for each pyruvate, we lose one as it turns into acetyl-CoA. We lose two more as that acetyl-CoA spins around the, um, the Krebs cycle. And since two pyruvates are made from every initial glucose, we're gonna have ultimately six carbon dioxides that have been formed. So at this point, we're done with keeping track of the CO2. Does, it, does that make sense? I got lost. <laughs> the cycle is happening twice, one for each of... Right, right, pyruvate. There's two, two made in glycolysis, right? There's two acetyl coas that go through the same process essentially. Yeah. So each pyruvate becomes an acetyl CoA, and each of those acetyl coas will go through that cycle. So those two pyruvates, each of them lose a carbon to become acetyl CoA and lose two more carbons as they go through this cycle. So three carbons lost for each pyruvate, that's six carbons in all to make those six carbon dioxides. Obviously, we gotta make some good stuff here. Carbon dioxide is a waste product. So the other thing that's made in the Krebs cycle is um, ATP and NADH. So for each spin, we're gonna end up with um, one ATP, And we're going to make a whole bunch of, we're going to make three NADH and one what's called FADH, um, which is just another, ver another electron carrier. So FADH is just, an, you, you don't worry about the difference. It's the same basic kind of character. NADH and FADH are both things, when you see them, they're holding on to really high energy electrons that you can give to something in redox reactions and release that energy and capture it. So if we think about this now, 
from the original glucose, if we spun around this Krebs cycle twice, we've just made two more ATP. So if we kind of go back to our accounting here, from glycolysis, we've made two ATP, right? We talked about that, two net ATP from glycolysis. We just made two more ATP going through two spins of the Krebs cycle. But still, we don't have the 36 ATP. So where is that energy? That energy is still stored in all those NADHs. A quick question. So for the two cycles, based off the beginning of the two pyruvates, we get two ATPs, six NADHs, and two FADHs? Or exactly. Just... Yeah, okay. Exactly. Exactly. So now what we got to think about, we have a bunch of this NADH floating around which has got a lot of energy in it. In writing, we had NADHs from, two NADHs from the original steps in, in glycolysis as well. So we need to still get that energy that's stored in NADH and somehow make it into ATP, right? Because that's what we want. We want ATP, but right now, most of our energy is still stored in this high energy electron carrier. So the next step, is going to be what's called the electron transport system or the electron transport chain, which is kind of cool. I'm sorry, what is that part called again? I'm going to write it out right now. You know, these are called, the, the, the actual membrane proteins are called cytochromes. And these are specialized to, it's, you can think of it kind of like a waterfall for electrons. The NADH comes here. It gives two electrons into this electron transport system, you know, and then we just have NAD plus plus H plus comes off here, right? So NADH breaks apart, donates its high energy electrons. And basically each of these cytochromes, each of these specialized membrane proteins is basically catching electrons at a slightly lower energy level. So the electrons keep getting handed off from one to the next. Um, again, think about it, if you think about it as kind of the metaphor of gravity, potential energy with respect to gravity, um, I could have this thing that I lift up to a really high level that would be like held in NADH, and then I can drop it, let it fall to a lower level. And as it falls, I might be able to capture that energy through a paddle wheel, then drop it to even lower level. As you as the electrons get handed off from one cytochrome to the next, it releases energy as the energy, as the electrons land in a lower energy state. And that energy is gonna be used to pump protons into that intermembrane space. So this is where it gets, what is that energy doing? That energy is pumping pumping protons. H plus, right, is a proton. Hydrogen ion is just a proton. So H, I'll say H plus, or I'll say protons, it's the same difference. So the energy created does what? The energy that is released as the electrons from NADH go through this electron transport system, pump protons into this intermembrane space and create this major proton gradient, where there's a lot of protons here compared to inside the cell. So if here, I can, this will be useful maybe. Um, first energy was in glucose, just the bonds of glucose. 
Then we had two ATP plus kind of the bonds of pyruvate and the electrons in the NADH. That was glycolysis. So the energy first was in the bonds of glucose. Then we had a couple of ATP where, that have energy, but we still have a lot of, um, whoops, what am I? We have energy stored in the bonds of the pyruvate molecule and also in the high energy electrons in the NADH. So this was glycolysis. Now we're in the mitochondria. Um, we have kind of more, more ATP that's formed, but then lots of the energy stored in the electrons of lots of NADH. And then we use those high energy electrons through that electron transport system to pump protons into that intermembrane space. Um, and now energy is stored in proton gradient. in that intermembrane space. So the energy started out in the bonds of glucose. Now the energy is actually stored in a concentration gradient of protons. That's why I said it's like a Rube Goldberg thing. Right, we use the NADH with the high energy electrons. We use a special electron transport system with these cytochromes that accept the electrons, let the electrons fall again, like the metaphor I think of is they fall, well, similarly, I guess, like a waterfall, water falls down a waterfall. As they fall down from higher to lower energy um, state, you can capture that energy that's released and it's used to pump protons pump H pluses into this intermembrane space. And so now we have this gradient, lots of protons in this space that want to come back down into the matrix. And we're gonna have one last piece and then we're done with this. We're gonna have the ATP synthase, which is a specialized membrane protein that allows the protons to come in. So this thing I'm drawing here, I, let me give it a, I wanna make sure you know what its name is. Um, this is such a mess, isn't it? Um, well, let me erase this a little bit. This is going to be called this ATP synthase is going to allow hydrogens to cross back here, but it captures that energy to drive a the assembly of ATP. So as this, so ADP plus phosphate becomes ATP. So that's coupled together. These things actually look like little rotors. It's actually kind of crazy. If you look at them, they're these little molecular machines. As the hydrogens go from one side of the membrane to the other, it actually physically changes the shape of this thing and drives the um, production of ATP. I have a quick question. Uh -huh. um, when you said the cytochromes, they, when they drop to a lower level energy level um, and it captures the energy, does it also increase the energy or does it just capture all of it? And it, then- it, it, it can't increase. It only just transforms it from one form to another. Oh, okay. Right, kind of the same way if you have a reservoir, you know, water at the top of the hill and it's going down and, you know, you know, driving a turbine for a, for a generator, 
you're only going to get as much energy as was originally stored in the potential energy due to gravity that the water had. So it's just transforming it from one form into another. So the electron transport system, sometimes it's called the electron transport chain, is converting the energy that is stored in the electrons of the NADH into energy stored into the proton gradient concentration or concentration gradient of the protons. Okay, I think the protons kind of confused me because I thought that was kind of pushing positive energy into, but that has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so now if we kind of go back. Sorry, can I just clarify something really quick? Yeah. Um, okay, so once the H, H plus is in that intermediate space, then you're saying um, the ATP synthesis moves it back into like the matrix area as ATP? Well, no, it, so the last step, lastly, you know, this energy in the concentration gradient is used to drive the manufacture of ATP using that ATP synthase. Um, maybe I should draw another picture here. Um, so here's a bunch of H pluses in this intermembrane space. Um, they want to go back this way due to their concentration gradient. Um, but the only way they get in is this specialized ATP synthase this membrane protein here in this inner membrane it allows the H pluses to come in but it couples it with the manufacture of you know ADP adenosine diphosphate plus inorganic phosphate becomes ATP Normally, this does not run on its own, right? It takes energy to make ATP. The energy to actually assemble the ATP is coming from the energy that was stored in this gradient. And because of this specialized membrane protein, this ATP synthase, like I said, it's, it genuinely is like a little turbine. As the H pluses come through, it actually kind of moves and um, drives the synthesis, the, it catalyzes the synthesis, right? To make ATP, it's ADP, which is A, you know, plus inorganic phosphate to make ATP. Just adenosine with three phosphates. So it so, must couple with the hydrogen ion in order to create the ATP. The ener it has to, it, yeah, the movement of the hydrogen ions through this membrane protein is linked to the manufacture of the ATP. The energy to make, to make this reaction happen comes through a linkage of the extracting the energy of this concentration gradient. So it's like stored kinetic energy in a way? No, it's stored, it's, well, it's, it's potential energy. Or potential in energy, rather. Yeah, so it's potential energy that gets converted to kinetic energy as the as the ions flow across, and that is used to drive the manufacture of the ATP. I have a question. Uh huh. And so the way the oxygen comes into all of this is that it's the final electron acceptor. Exactly. So good. Um, yeah, normally people, people don't pick up on that. So I'm glad you brought that up. So let's talk about that. So again, the pumping of the, oops. The pumping of the protons is happening via the cytochromes. So here's my cytochromes in my electron transport system. Uh, 
Um, let me erase some of this other stuff here. Just get it in the way. Again, we talked about NADH breaks apart, feeds two two electrons go into here, you know, and then it becomes NAD plus plus H plus out here. But so these two these two electrons are going in, going through, pumping the protons. But some, you know, electrons don't just fall into space. Something has to accept them at the end of this whole process. So you basically need something that can hold, capture the electrons and take them away, or else this whole thing's going to back up. And that is where oxygen comes in. Oxygen is famous for having this really low electronegativity. It is something that holds electrons like down in the basement, so to speak, right? It's where they can fall to like this lowest level. So at the very end, you basically get these two electrons plus an oxygen plus two H pluses. And what is that gonna become? Water. Water. So this is where the oxygen and the water come in. If you don't have oxygen, then the electrons can't ever get picked up and out of the electron transport system. This thing just backs up. The gradient um, doesn't work and you don't make ATP. So it's, it's one of those interesting things. Like if you tell somebody, like how come somebody dies if you strangle them? It's like, because they're, they're not getting any oxygen, but why do you die if you don't get any oxygen? Because you need oxygen, but you know, why do you need oxygen? It's this is why you need oxygen. You need oxygen because it's the final electron acceptor. You know, Oxygen can pick up the electrons and take them out of this chain and free it up for the next round. And in that process, it just makes water. So, you know, if we go back to the original um, thing here, this is where we're finally getting rid of the, you know, taking care of the oxygen and the water. Those are happening in that last step of picking up those electrons off of the electron transport chain. You need the oxygens to accept the electrons and get them out of there. And in that process, you make water as a metabolic byproduct. And so that is now we've done everything. We started with a sugar. We ended up with six CO2s. Um, all that energy that was stored in the proton gradient, it's enough to ultimately make an a net total of 36 ATP from the original, the original sugar. Does that make sense? Right, so we start with glucose. From glucose, we have the energy stored in like, you know, we, we had some ATP. Then we have energy stored in pyruvate and NADH, this becomes, you know, acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle. We make lots more NADH. So now we have lots of energy stored in these high energy electrons. You know, these then, you know, use that electron transport system. You know, to pump protons. Now energy in proton gradient. You know, so we started here one, 
was in glucose. You know, two, it's all stored in the NADH. Um, three, the energy is stored in the proton gradient. And finally, we use that energy stored in the proton gradient to drive that ATP synthase to actually make the ATP, which is what we want in the very end. You know, four, use gradient to make ATP. Ooh. Yep, that was a, a lot of things going on there. Actually, that took longer than 20 minutes, dag nabbit. Um, does, does that make sense? Um, you know, when you're, even if it makes sense, you know, with the next, you walk away from it, it won't make sense. But if you just read it a few times and your book goes through it, it will make sense. But keep track. You do not need to know, like if you were in a, bi like a major's biology class or something, you would actually have to memorize the names of the different intermediates and enzymes and things like that. You don't need to know that for this class, but you should know the basic process as I've, as I've described it. You should have a sense of where is the energy stored at the different steps, right? First, the energy was stored just in the glucose. You know, by the end, we have the energy stored in the ATP, but in, along the way, it's, you know, stored in the potential energy of NADH, or it's stored in the potential energy of the proton gradient. So make sure you understand kind of those different steps. Um, now for completeness, let me just add in, you know, other entry points. You know, obviously glucose, this whole thing is using glucose, but you know, normally, you know, your food that gives you energy, there's carbohydrates, there's lipids, there's proteins. Ultimately, these are gonna have to get fed into glycolysis. You know, for carbohydrates, how could you, you know, let's say you had starch. How can we start with starch and end up feeding it into glycolysis? Leave it into glucose? Yeah, all starch is, is a bunch of glucoses connected together. So all we need to do is break apart the glucoses and then we're good to go, right? So this is the most direct way to store energy you can just store it as big chains of glucoses in starch and then break apart those glucoses and they feed straight into cellular respiration. Um, lipids and fats are a little more complicated, um, but not that much more complicated. Um, remember we, hacked, we talked about a glycerol with these kind of hydrocarbon tails hanging off from the fatty acids. It turns out that all you need to do is you take this thing, you can chop off these hydrocarbon tails, two carbons at a time, and turn them into acetyl CoAs, which, you know, which then feeds into the Krebs cycle that we just saw. The glycerol feeds into glycolysis. Right, so it takes more work to take a fat, you have to like kind of disassemble it and it feeds into different parts of the metabolic pathway we just described. But there's nothing, nothing surprising here really. You're taking two carbon pieces off the tails to make acetyl-CoA's, two carbon acetyl-CoA's which feed into Krebs. The glycerol feeds into glycolysis. Um, the thing you should be aware of for fat breakdown is some of the intermediates in this process are called ketone bodies. Um, the reason why you want to know this is that if they are showing up in your body, they show up in your analysis.
you know, they give you information that your body is involved with breaking down fats to make, make energy at the moment. Right? So if you have very high levels of ketone bodies, what might that mean? That your body's primarily using fat. Yeah, for it might mean that you're on the Atkins diet or caveman diet and all you're eating is bacon or something. Or it might mean that you're just fasting. You know, what, Saturday or th what, Thursday, some people aren't going to be eating most of the day and there's going to be body having to go into fat breakdown for energy and you'll get high levels of ketones as that happens. You know, it can also be like in diabetes, you get that too, where the cells are not absorbing sugar properly and are having to break down fat. So ketone bodies might just be, you know, based on your diet or based on not eating at all, or it might be a sign that there's something going on. It depends on the condition. They're not necessarily a bad thing, but there's something to pay attention to. Um, proteins. What's the building block of a protein? Amino acid. Amino acids. Yeah, the amino acid. Um, the main thing to know about breaking down proteins to make um, energy is this amino group gets taken off. So the first step you deaminate the amino acid, but then that becomes ammonia, which is not good to float around. So the liver actually takes these and assembles them into these little two, takes two of them and makes urea, which is not gonna be so reactive. And it gets, you know, goes up in your blood and eventually your kidneys get it out of your body. So urea gets formed as this nitrogenous waste as your body is deaminating proteins to make break them down. And then the rest of this thing, you know, it depends on what type of amino acid it is. Some amino acids are going to get fed into one part of the metabolic pathway versus another. But the main thing to know about, about um, breaking down proteins for energy is that the first step is deaminating. Deaminating gives you these nitrogens that you need to take care of, and they're taken care of by being assembled into urea, which is going to just then sit around and you eventually just get rid of, assuming your kidneys are working well. You know, when we talk about functions of the kidneys, you know, getting rid of nitrogenous wastes, that's one of the big, big, ma the major nitrogenous wastes we talk about, that urea from protein breakdown. Um, that all makes sense? So elevated urea in the blood, or sorry, in the, in the urine, what might that indicate? That, I don't know. I don't know, even even know what an elevated level of urea would be. So yeah, I don't know. Um, so, uh, the last, the very, very last thing I will put in here for completeness, complete completeness, gluconeogenesis, partly because it's a cool word. Gluco, sugar, Neo new creation genesis. So there are certain cells in your body, particularly the CNS cells, like your neurons, like neurons in the CNS can only use sugar. Um, they need sugar. So if you don't have sugar in your blood from um, your diet, you need to make sugar for your neurons in your brain. So gluconeogenesis is basically running, running glycolysis backwards.
you know, it, it, it does almost all the same steps. It's slightly different. Um, and obviously it's gonna take a little bit of energy to make it run, but it's basically making new glucose. So you have it for the cells that need the glucose to, to do their, to get their energy. So you should know about gluconeogenesis. It's just, it means making glucose from scratch, basically. Instead of breaking down glucose into other things, you take other things and make it into glucose. What if I'm in this whole big mess, but I have enough ATP already? I don't need more ATP. What am I gonna do with my, with my metabolic pathways as I start releasing all this energy from sugar? Start storing sugar? Yeah, I can use these acetyl-CoA's and I can start assembling together into fats. You know, so I'll start storing, instead of storing sugar, you should, sugar is not the most efficient way to store energy. Fat, you can get two and a half times as much energy in the same amount of weight. Uh, you know, one gram of fat has two and a half times as much energy as one gram of carbohydrate. So fat is much more efficient way to store energy. So if you have enough enough ATP already, you can just break down the sugar, but then like store it as fat for a rainy day, which is a nice, yeah, it's good. Um, so I've just, yeah, I just talked about a bunch of stuff. Cellular respiration. Are there any questions? We started with just a glucose in the cytosol with the orig original steps of glycolysis getting broken down into a couple of pyruvate, a couple of ATP, and a couple of NADHs. And then we took it into the mitochondria, did all that other stuff. Um, Any, any questions before we walk away from this for a bit? Um, I have some questions about the last things you were talking about, not about urea. Um, are there like specific names, say for lipids being turned into um, like being moved towards <clears throat> respiration uh, pathways? Mm -hmm. Does that I make think, sense? I, I think, I think, in fact, when, I'm pretty sure one of the words people use, why is my system not working? Oh, no. I think, oh, there it is. Yeah, like that. People say lipolysis, <laughs> breaking apart, breaking apart okay. fats. Yeah. Um, there's probably more, but it's, I'm not coming out of the top of my head. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Um, so again, if you were in a major's biology class or a kind of biochemistry class, you'd have to get way deeper into what are all of the individual intermediates and enzymes. Again, for our class, that's not necessary. What you need to know is the broader, the broader feel for this, where the energy is at the different states, some of the main intermediates you need to know pyruvates and NADHs and you know acetyl CoA's and things like that. But you need you don't need to know you don't have to get into nitty gritty details about what enzyme is catalyzing one step to the next or something. So you know when you're studying this or reading it or you're looking at you know you're looking at a picture like this. Whoop, let me. Um, you're looking at this in your, your book. Don't worry about isocitrate and ketoglutarate and succinol, whatever. You know, think about, oh, here's the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. And it's making lots of NADH with these high energy electrons that are gonna be used to pump electrons. And it's making a bit of ATP. 
you know, so think about the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle in the big picture, like what goes in, what comes out, why is it important rather than getting stuck trying to memorize little bits and, you know, so, because, you know, the book, the book will go into more detail than you need. Um, so just kind of, it's still going to be a lot for you to get, but just to make it a little less, a little less intimidating. 